Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, and it is posted to our website later in the day. Um, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can see, um, where you'll be able to see today's archives and any of our other previous archives. Both the live show and our recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think may be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, as the Nebraska Library Commission, we are the state agency for all libraries in the state of Nebraska. So we have shows on all sorts of topics and for all types of libraries. So you will find things for uh, public, academic, K-12 schools, uh, museums, correctional facilities. If it's a library or has a library in it, you'll probably find something in our archives of interest to you, either in our um, archives or in our upcoming shows. Um, we do do a mixture of types of sessions here on um, Encompass Live, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services or products, anything that we think may be of interest to libraries. Uh, sometimes we do do sessions with Nebraska Library Commission staff presenting for us on things that are either local to us or services or programs that we're offering here um, in Nebraska for our Nebraska libraries. But we also bring in guest speakers sometimes, and that's what we have this morning. Um, on the line with us is Teresa Stannard. Good morning, Teresa. Good morning. Good morning. And she is the director, library director at the Parchment Michigan Community Library. And she is going to talk to us this morning about ditching Dewey. Yay. Well, <laughs> depends on your point of view <laughs> or opinion. Um, that, I know this is a thing that many libraries are investigating. And um, she's going to talk about how they did it um, in their library and uh, the process of that. Uh, this is a session, um, something I'll mention to you as well, that um, once a year, we do an annual online conference of an all-day thing, uh, all-day event like this one, but for um, eight hours, called Big Talk from Small Libraries. And this was one of the presentations submitted to that. This year, we had too many presentations <laughs> to fill a day. So um, some of them, what we are showing here on our Encompass Live Show. And I'm glad to hear th that you were able to join us this time, Teresa, that we didn't, so that we could share your information. Oh, my pleasure. Even though we ran out of space in our one day, <laughs> someday maybe Big <laughs> Talk will end up being a two-day event. We'll see if I can handle that myself. But <laughs> for today, we have you on the show, so I'll just hand it over to you to take it away and tell us about your, what you did at your library with Dewey. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. Uh, as she said, I'm Teresa Stannard, and I've been the director of the Parchment Library since 2001. And this is the story of how we converted our nonfiction collection from the Dewey Decimal to the BISAC classification system and lived to tell about it. And phrasing <laughs> it that way, you might expect, and it's true that there were a couple of days when we thought we might not. Understandable, yes. <laughs> All right, let's see, there we go. Uh, here's the table of contents, so to speak, for today's session. Uh, I will say that this is the first presentation that I've done as a webinar, uh, as opposed to uh, an in-person session. And I do miss being able to see all your faces and hear your voices. But uh, though we can't hear each other, I'm really glad you're here with me today. Do feel free to ask questions throughout, and I've left time at the end for more questions at the end of the presentation. All right, there we are. Parchment is a small town just north of Kalamazoo. Yes, there really is a Kalamazoo in Southwest Lower Michigan. Uh, if you ask a stranger where they're from and they instantly raise their hand to use as a map, they are from Michigan. We do it all the time. We do it to strangers, we do it to one another. It's what we do in Michigan. If they raise their right hand and hold it uh, vertically, they're from the Lower Peninsula. If they raise their left hand and hold it uh, horizontally, they're from the Upper Peninsula. And you can see the happy fellow there on the right is pointing to Kalamazoo. So now you know exactly uh, where we are uh, in the state of Michigan. And a quick, very brief 20 second history of the city of Parchment. Uh, in 1909, a paper mill that specialized in, uh, you guessed it, Parchment paper, opened up on the Kalamazoo River here. And uh, 
the uh, roads, of course, uh, if you can call them roads at that time from Kalamazoo to this location, were essentially mud tracks. And the workers had a terrible time getting to the mill. In fact, many of them pitched tents and lived in tents. And so the mill owner, Jacob Kindleberger, started building homes for the workers and their families. And that is how the city of Parchment began. However, uh, Jacob wanted to build not only a state-of-the-art paper mill, he also wanted to build a community city. I mean, a community city, a uh, model city. And uh, he did that. Uh, he added a 60-acre park, which is right behind the library. It's absolutely gorgeous. Right next to the library, though it no longer exists, was a huge community uh, hall. And in that, there was a full theater, there was a dining hall, there was an exercise room, there was a community kitchen, and a community workshop, a wood shop that people could come and do projects in. So uh, that means that Parchment has always been uh, quite a lovely place to live and to raise a family in. The mill unfortunately closed in 2000 and took with it most of our tax base. And we have been figuring things out since then, but Parchment uh, continues to survive and thrive. And I'm happy to say uh, we have a lot of strong community support for the library. We serve a population of just under 10,000 in our library district, of which about 1,800 are in the square mile Parchment city limits. Our print collection is just about 35,000 volumes, of which uh, now about 8,200 are adult nonfiction. And we have a staff of 14, most of whom are part-time. So why did we decide to put ourselves through this? Uh, it started when we noticed more and more and more of our younger patrons, meaning teens and then folks in their 20s also, uh, who had no idea what the Dewey Decimal System was. And we found out that they had stopped teaching it in the schools quite some time ago. And uh, after we had so many people come up saying, I don't get these numbers, how am I supposed to find this thing? Uh, we started talking about um, what we could do to help that situation. Of course, we started with what we all do, which is put uh, extra signage up to explain um, and make it clear what's what. And it helped a little, but it really wasn't the answer. And at the same time, we noticed our nonfiction uh, circulation figures had the dwindles. and. Uh, when we compared each month to the month from the year before, um, we uh, realized that we were just drifting downward all the time. And we talked about how could we uh, turn that around. So we visited uh, quite a few libraries in Southwest Lower Michigan, and we found two that had switched to um, word-based uh, classification. Uh, one of them was the Helen Warner branch in Battle Creek, and they had invented their own. It's very similar to BISAC, but it's their own uh, system. And then the Kent District Library in uh, the Grand Rapids area had a branch that had used BISAC as the framework and had edited that. And uh, we kicked it around and, and did some test runs, and we decided that we just didn't have the manpower to create our own system from scratch. And what the Helen Warner branch had done really wasn't working for us. So we decided to go with BISAC and make edits as necessary. All right, now that we decided that we were gonna do this thing, <laughs> we had to figure out how to do it. And as I said, of course, we're gonna be using the BISAC headings as our framework and BISAC stands for Book Industry Subject and Category Code. Uh, the second tool that we came up with that was a lifesaver is we created a shared document. Uh, we used Google Docs. You can use whatever works for you. We used Google Docs. And we created our master list. And this was our working tool as we were building our subject headings list. And all the team members could um, uh, create comments and questions. It was very much how we talked to one another on a daily basis. And uh, it, it proved invaluable. And now that everything's said and done, this is the list that we use um, as our uh, reference list as we're cataloging books. And we continue to edit it as needed. I'm sure most of you who use Dewey have a copy of the DDC, that four volume set, uh, sitting around that your catalogers use. And there are probably lots of penciled notes in those volumes. Um, so that future catalogers will know how um, things have been done in your particular library 
so that the system remains consistent. And that's exactly what our Google Doc is doing for us. Uh, finally, I purchased some Dymo label makers so that each of our team members would have easy access to one as they were working. And we decided that um, to keep books um, off the shelf for a minimum amount of time, this is how it had to happen, that each team member would work on a book, decide the classification, change it in the ILS uh, online record, and then also create the new spine label, apply it, and get that book right back on the shelf. And um, that really saved us time. And usually books were off the shelf for two hours at, at the most, and that was wonderful. Um, our team is composed of the director, that's me, and two and sometimes three of the folks that help with cataloging, and also our children's librarian. And I do recommend that you keep your work team small um, because if you had, I have 14 staff and I tried to involve 14 staff intimately in this project, it just would have gotten cumbersome and, and it wouldn't have gotten done uh, efficiently. But don't keep the team too small and I don't, and, and you know who you are. I mean those who are thinking I should do this by myself. If one person is doing it, it's tempting to think that that would be then the most consistent. Um, it won't work. And I'll tell you why. Um, because the, the DDC Dewey is a mature system of classification that was built for libraries. And BISAC is essentially subject headings that were built for bookstores. And so it's not comparing apples to apples. In fact, it's more like comparing apples to chainsaws. It really isn't um, a very easy thing to do. And so if there's just one person trying to figure this out, um, I think it's gonna be just too overwhelming. And so we had a team, a small team of people, all of whom were intimately acquainted with what we were doing and how we were getting it done. And all of us, all of us ran into roadblocks every week. We had some titles we just didn't know what to do with or a subject classification. We weren't sure which way we ought to go with it. And we were able to discuss it uh, with our fellow team members. And that collaboration is what got us down the road. And drawing the map while driving is uh, how I tried to explain what we were about to do to the team as we were launching it. Um, really, we're going uh, down the road and we're uh, looking about 20 feet ahead and drawing the map as we go. So that means, of course, you're going to hit some roadblocks, you're going to hit some cul-de-sacs, and you got to turn around. Uh, times you're going to have to go more slowly than you'd like. Um, it's all part of the process. So we all had to relax. Uh, uh, if you are catalogers out there, you know you want to get things precisely right, and you want to do it the first time. Well, in this process, that really wasn't possible. So we all had to relax into it a bit. Um, separate and collaborate uh, seems a little mutually exclusive. It's not. Separate, I mean, uh, assign a Dewey section to a single team member. So that team member can really get to understand that section as a whole. And that will inform them when they're trying to break it up into the various BISAC sections. Some BISAC categories like cookbooks are dead simple. I mean, you can just grab it from uh, 641.5 and plunk it down into cooking and Bob's your uncle. There are others like social services, like self-help, and there are many more that will end up uh, having under the same Dewey number, you'll have many different BISAC headings. So uh, having a Dewey section or a large part of a Dewey section under the control of one person really does help them grasp the uh, whole picture. And do meet often with the team, and I mean often like weekly at least, uh, to discuss uh, problems you're having and uh, how things are going and review that master list together. Um, do schedule those meetings. Don't uh, just expect them to happen off the cuff because it really is important for the whole team to get together often. Uh, continue to use that master list as a working tool and don't be afraid to type in comments, questions as you go and the whole team will be reading it and that will really help um, those weekly meetings. And we also use some extra Google documents uh, to track our progress and I'll show you those uh, in just a moment. 
And those all helped keep us on uh, track. So don't give up. Uh, it may seem overwhelming, especially at first. We found it got easier as we got used to the process. So uh, don't throw in the towel, it will happen. And it's also a dandy opportunity to get in the stacks and really weed that nonfiction collection as a whole. And I have to say, we hadn't weeded ours in its entirety in about five years when we started this project. So we really dug in there and found a lot of dead wood that we didn't think was there, but there it was when we really dug into it. And um, so we ended up getting rid of a, a significant percentage of our nonfiction. We, we got rid of quite a few books that weren't doing any good. And now our collection looks great on the shelf and it's all very fresh and vibrant and easy to find and not overcrowded. And it's been a good thing. Uh, finally, don't worry about getting it perfect. And, and I'm speaking to all my, my fellow catalogers out there. Again, don't sweat the small stuff. If you can't decide as a team which is exactly right, make your best guess, go that way, and move on. If you have to redo a couple of things at the end of the day when it's all done, it really isn't that big a deal. So don't sweat the small stuff. Just relax and keep going. All right, um, I'm going to take you right now to the BISAC website. So bear with me while I press a couple of buttons here. There we go. And there we are. This is the uh, subject headings page. Uh, and um, scroll down, and there they are. Those are the BISAC headings. And I'm certainly not going to take you through all of these, but I will want, I do want to point out just a couple of things very briefly. I'm going to click on medical and scroll down and under medical, I hope you can see this, uh, this introductory paragraph. Not all of the BISAC primary headings have an introductory paragraph. If they do, do not neglect to read it. It gives you wonderfully useful information and as to the intent of the subject headings and it gives you a lot of guidance um, as you move forward. And I'll scroll down and you can see we've got uh, the sub subheadings starting to come into play. And there are many, many, <laughs> as you can see. So um, that may be overwhelming. It's not so bad. It works out once you uh, get to know it a little bit. And I'm going to back up and take you very briefly again to one other heading, cooking. And uh, I wanted to point out um, a intermediary subheading is what we called it. You see the courses and dishes here. Um, we don't need that on our spine labels. So we got rid of a lot of these and went right to um, the tertiary heading and left this out of the spine label entirely. Again, as I, I think I may have said before, um, uh, the Dewey Decimal System was intended for libraries. It's made for spine labels. BISAC is not. And if you're not careful, you're going to end up with a very crowded and overly complicated spine label. You don't want too many subheadings. And that means you're going to have to get creative about what you use and what you don't use and how you truncate and how you abbreviate things to fit in a logical, easy for your patrons to understand way. All right, that's, that's the BISAC subject heading page. And I, I won't spend too much time on that. I'll get back to the presentation. All right, and here are the uh, headings that we selected. That's most of them that are on the BISAC website. They are a couple like fiction or youth fiction that we, of course, uh, jettisoned, but that's where we started. And now I'll show you what we ended up with. Here is our edited list. And uh, as you can see, we did a lot of uh, truncation. And in fact, we truncated even more than that to fit it on our, our spine labels. For example, technology is tech, T-E-C-H. Um, and uh, and uh, so you're going to have to do that to make it fit on a spine label. These weren't created for spine labels. And also you'll see in the red bold, these are headings that we created ourselves. We couldn't find exactly what we wanted in BISAC and so we made our own. Uh, animals, for example, uh, in BISAC is a subheading of nature. 
and we had so many books on animals and our students use them so much that we thought it warranted its own section. And so we added that. Um, health and fitness, uh, as we got into it, uh, we realized that we had so many books on health and so many books on fitness, we really ought to divide that up for clarity. And that's just what we did. We created a new primary heading called fitness. Uh, pets, as you can see, is its own uh, primary heading in BISAC, but uh, we decided uh, to put it as a subheading under animals. And this is one of those uh, things that we didn't get right uh, the first time. We uh, thought pets should be its own section, and that's what we did. But once we got done with the shelving uh, and looked at how small that collection was, we thought, oh, we've got it wrong, and now we need to put it as a subset of animals. And it only took us a couple of days. It wasn't that big a deal. And so my advice to you is if you make your best guess and it turns out to be wrong, it's not the end of the world. Just fix it and move on. And our children's librarian created her own list for the juvenile nonfiction. And so you can see um, our red, uh, uh, bold red terms that we invented for adult. And the purple bold terms are ones that she added for the children's collection. And that just goes to show that you have a lot of leeway. You make this work for your particular library, your clientele, your particular collection. So you do have a lot of uh, leeway for that. And our, our wonderful children's librarian did all 2,500 of the juvenile nonfiction books herself. Um, and that's because uh, she, like every other children's librarian I've ever met, is a force of nature. You simply give a children's librarian a project and step back and watch them go. It's amazing. I think, all Teresa, right. I think, yeah. I think that's a, um, important thing you're saying there about customizing this to your own library. Um, many people, when they're hearing about people, a library is going away from Dewey to something else, they automatically go to the stereotypical thinking of, oh, we're just gonna make it like a bookstore. No, and I can't find anything in bookstores anyways. <laughs> no, that's not what this is about. This is, it, it's, it's actually very similar to working with Dewey or other, Tra traditional library catalog uh, classification systems in that you can customize it to what is going on in your library and what's 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 there for you um just be flexible with it and just think of it as another even though it's come came originally that bisec did of course from you know a bookstore point of view think mm -hmm. of it as just like another library um classification system and use it that way exactly yeah. Yep. The, the toughest part is um, not overcrowding those spine labels, um, yeah. keeping those subheadings to a minimum. With Dewey, it's so easy. You want to make it more uh, uh, you know, granulated, more finely. All you do is add a couple of digits to the end of that uh, Dewey mm -hmm. number. Um, with BISEC, you're going to be adding um, another word onto the spine label. So you really have to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. You have to be more is, creative with it yourself. Yep. Just like with the tech, yeah, things that are obvious shortened, yeah. Yeah, yep. so, um, and, and you'll work that out uh, as a team as you go. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, um, here are the shared lists, and I'm certainly not going to take much time on this. You will have a link at the end to our master uh, BISAC list for adult nonfiction, and you're free to take a look at that at any time, and I'm just going to give you a quick glimpse at it right now so you see what I'm talking about. Yeah, Sorry. and I'll make a point here while you're yeah. doing this, um, Teresa, okay. that yes, for everyone on the show, at the end when we do the, the archives for this, we'll have a recording of the show, um, a link to her slides, and um, the URL to this as well. So don't try and write down and scribble down that ridiculous Google Docs <laughs> uh, URL, <laughs> no, though. There, you'll have that will be emailed to you automatically after this show when the right. archive is ready. <laughs> okay, well, here it is. This is our... Um, our version of the uh, DDC four volume set. It's our, our working list. And uh, you can see at the heading here, I've, I've got uh, what I call a jump list of, uh, so you can jump down to various sections. And of course, uh, there's the, uh, the list here that you can scroll. I, I, I don't know, I'm just a little old lady and I really hate scrolling. So I went to the trouble of, of making this, but you don't have. Uh, at the beginning, we have our spine label format. As I mentioned before, each team member was creating their own spine labels. 
So if you want a consistent look on your shelf, you'd better make sure that everybody's doing it exactly the same. And this is how we got that done. And then you'll see, um, here we go. Um, these are the uh, primary headings and subheadings that we used. And you can see for animals, we really didn't um, do a lot. There are some, some notes here and there, but we didn't make too many changes. Uh, but when you get to something like, let me jump down, mind and spirit, good, grief, look what we did, it's nothing but red. Uh, and that's because we just couldn't, again, that was the apples to chainsaws thing. Uh, we couldn't make it work as neatly as we'd like, so we worked at it and this is what we came up with. But again, this is our working document and as we catalog, we use this. And one of the best features is the uh, control F, which I'm gonna do right now, and that's the find in document uh, control. And it was invaluable as we were working through this. If I get a book on say divorce, I wanna see if another person working in another section might have also cataloged a book on divorce. And I would type in divorce and find out if it's there and if so, where they put it. Um, I'm gonna use running as an example. You can see we've got two instances of running. Is that right? Uh, we've got one here under sports. And we've got another under fitness. And in fact, that is exactly correct. Like Dewey, as you know, there are uh, several places you can put the same subject, depending. And we had a section of books on running for fitness, and they belong here. And then we, had a, we have a, a big community of marathoners in Kalamazoo, a big community. And so we have a section of books on uh, training for a marathon. And so that belongs under sports, because that's competitive running. So there you go. Um, use the, the find feature. And as you can see, this is what we did to keep ourselves um, real clear on what we were doing. And we often, they're all cleaned up now, but we had, um, you know, we could put in comments, uh, you know, should I do this or that or see also uh, that we would communicate as team members one to the other. And uh, so when we had our weekly meetings, we would all have been going through this all week long and we would have a very productive discussion, a very efficient discussion because of that. So we found this just wonderful. Um, and I think, let me just take a peek. Yep, here's the Google document that we use to track our progress. The questions box is happily empty. <laughs> it wasn't always empty. And uh, we weeded the collection first. We had a team weeding and once a section was weeded, then it was ready for reclassification because we found it too cumbersome for the same team member to be wondering if we should keep this item or not and then try to reclassify it all at the same go. Um, this really, and we started that way, but this really uh, early on, we decided to do it this way instead and it helped a lot. Um, so here's a, a paragraph that I wrote of how, what's happening and why. And uh, here's the progress, happily, they all say done. Uh, but before that, we would have, instead of the word done, we would have the call number of the book where we stopped and our initials and the date. And so uh, as inevitably happens, someone goes on vacation or they've got flu and someone needs to step in, we would know exactly where everybody was and where we could pick up and keep the project rolling. And then down here is the relabeling, which is what we call the reclassification. And you can say, see that it's uh, happily done. Uh, and, but before that, we did the same thing. We'd have the call number where we stopped and the date. And, uh, and it worked out beautifully. So there we are. All right, so now you're relabeling and you're giving everything a bisect. So where on earth do you put it when you put it back on the shelf? Um, unless you've got a whole lot of empty shelves sitting around in your library, you're gonna have to think of a way to keep things in order until you finally get around to reshelving the whole collection. This is what we did. We kept a three digit Dewey at the top of the spine label. And then we put the primary bisect heading and any subheadings. Here's an example of that spine label. So 641 is the Dewey, not 641.5. Cooking in all caps uh, is what we used for the primary. And then a couple of subheadings, then a blank line, then the author's last name. And a reminder, of course, uh, that each of title that you handle has to be recataloged 
in the online ILS and also on the spine label. And make sure that everybody's on board with knowing exactly what that spine label is supposed to look like. So, uh, and, and as soon as you create the rule, of course, there are gonna be exceptions, that's how it goes. But it, for the most part, our spine labels look quite uniform despite having uh, five different people working on them. And do keep, again, I've said this before, do keep those subcategories to a minimum. As you can see, it won't take much to fill up that spine label, will it? And uh, you don't want to uh, be confusing to people or you defeat the whole purpose of this uh, project. You want to make it easy for your patrons to browse your shows. Um, <clears throat> if you may be tempted, and we were, um, when you have a Dewey number that's getting split up into a lot of different BISAC categories, you think, gosh, should we change that Dewey number to match the BISAC so that when it comes time to reshelve, things are more or less together on the shelf? Don't do it. Um, you're going to be losing time, not saving time. What you want is for every title that you reclassify to remain very close to their original Dewey position on your shelves. Keep that shelf shifting during the project to an absolute minimum. You're going to be able to uh, get it done uh, when you close the library to do the reshelving project. So don't try to do it ahead of time. Um, and it may be upsetting to have um, a, a Dewey number that's got a bunch of different BISAC primary headings underneath it. It's okay. I'll show you in a minute how we're showing them. Uh, the books are still findable via your OPAC. It's all good. People can find what they want just as quickly as they did before. It just feels weird. And do make sure that all staff understand the new shelving system. And spot check your shelvers. I had, I have rather wonderful, conscientious shelvers, but a couple of them uh, thought they understood it. And as it turned out, they didn't quite. And so I would just bring them back to the shelf and retrain and uh, only a couple of times. And then everybody was on the straight and narrow and everything looked nice and neat. Also, of course, talk to your patrons throughout the project. We had posters and brochures and things on the shelves, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the best thing we did, of course, was the one-on-one -on -one chats. Uh, when people say, what on earth are you doing? We'd explain why we're doing it and what we hope to achieve at the end. And um, you know, the vast majority of people were pleased uh, by the whole idea. A couple uh, older folks <laughs> weren't so happy with me, but I, we got them on board, so bless them. Um, so do make sure that you communicate well with your patrons all throughout the process. All right. I do, uh, I do a question yeah. about that, Teresa. Sure. Um, <clears throat> at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that the reason that people were having trouble finding things was that they were no longer teaching Dewey at the school, in the yeah. school, yeah. When, the, when the teens and children would come in. Um, did you, I mean, did you, the, is, was that how you started explaining it to your patrons as well? That it oh, wasn't, absolutely. we didn't yes. just come up with this out of the blue. There's, you no. know. No, I would explain that we have, you know, uh, people getting close to 30 years old um, mm -hmm. that are asking us, what do these numbers mean? Mm -hmm. And that uh, yeah. there's no, I, there were no plans to start teaching it again. I, I talked mm -hmm. with the uh, librarians and they said that there was only one librarian now for the media specialist for the whole school system. Mm -hmm. So there's no way that she could be conducting those classes. Right. Um, so, so we they knew that's use where it was going to stay. Are they using something different at the school as well for their classification? No, they're still using Dewey. They're just not teaching it. Uh, they're just not, the classes aren't coming in as often as they used to do when they had a media specialist for every school. Ah. They only have one media specialist for the entire system now. And uh, so uh, she just doesn't have the wherewithal. Mm -hmm. Oh, under totally understandable. And that's very, unfortunately. Oh, indeed it is. Common. Yeah. Yes. Hmm, okay. Yep, yep. So we thought if, if we're not able to reach them that way and our little explanatory signage wasn't working, what could we do? We can and, do something. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we decided to take on this project. Hmm. After visiting a couple libraries who had, we really liked right. how it worked. Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, here's a, a couple of options for you for shelving when you're in the midst of the project. Uh, the top one is what we used. We, um, as you can see, the first three there on option one are items that we've reclassified uh, under BISAC. And the two in bold red are the original Dewey. <clears throat> so we put um, in order at the beginning of every Dewey section, 
the new ones that we just reclassified, followed by all the ones that had not yet been classified. Um, another option for you is to perfectly interfile them, uh, which I've done, uh, showed you here on the bottom. Uh, and those are in perfect shelf order, but the um, ones that haven't been reclassified are interfiled with the ones that have. We found that even though that's lovely for patrons, it made it difficult for staff who were working in a section to catch all the ones that they may have missed. The option one kept everything neatly divided until the entire section was complete and you could easily go to your section and see where you left off and find what you've missed. So um, option one is what we use to keep things in order during the transition. That did mean we had to do perhaps a little more shelf shifting, but it was kept to a minimum. It didn't really take up a lot of our time to uh, keep the shelves in order as we worked. So um, pick it and do what works best for you. All right, let's, uh, the happy day has come and you've got everything uh, reclassified. So what do you do now? We closed the library for Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we're always closed on Sunday, but we closed Saturday too to give us two days just in case things went south. And uh, luckily it went very well indeed. Um, and I, after reshelving, of course, remember we put those Dewey numbers at the top of every single label. Well, what do you do to cover those up? We covered each one with a little white uh, self-stick label. Uh, that we bought in sheets. And um, I was worried that they might not hold up long term, but I just took this photo and uh, you can see that they're adhering perfectly well more than a year down the road. So it's doing what we need to do. And I will point out, if you look at this photo, one of these things is not like the others. Uh, <laughs> if you look at the book with the red spine, yep, uh, international is a different abbreviation than the other ones. And this was, uh, as you go, uh, these things happen. We started using this, uh, the, the I-N-T-E-R-N apostrophe L abbreviation for the first few. And then one of the team members pointed out it looks like internal <laughs> and thought that might be confusing for patrons. So we went to the more standardized I-N-T apostrophe L. Um, and we yeah. Caught them all, but we hadn't caught them all. So when I took this photo, I went, oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> and when you find these things, as you will, um, uh, just take off your cataloger hat and just smile and fix it and move on. And don't worry about it. It happens. You even counter that when you use Dewey and other systems as well. <laughs> oh, you bet. It happens. It happens. <laughs> so anyway, I had to laugh when I looked at that picture more closely. I thought, oh, yeah, here we are. All right. You're getting ready to reshelve. And so you want to be prepared before you start pulling books off. Let me tell you. Calculate the amount of shelf space you have available. Um, and that means shelf feet, uh, not just the number of shelves. I'm thinking most of us have the standard 36 inch wide shelf, but if you don't, then you have to know shelf feet, not just the amount of shelves. And uh, run a report, of course, on your ILS to see how many titles you own in each primary subject category. I'm talking only the primary headings, uh, animals, art, architecture, uh, cooking, that kind of thing. And then I used um, one and a half inches per title to calculate the number of shelves we'd need. And it worked pretty well. Uh, we had very little uh, kerfuffle as we were actually doing it that we had to shift things. We had a little bit, but it wasn't too bad. And make a map to follow. And I'll show you that in just a second. Do make a map. Don't neglect to make a map. You will be happy you did. Uh, and uh, so make sure that's done prior to everything else starting. And before the work crew arrives, label the starting shelf for each primary category. So you're gonna have a, a, some bold sticker that won't come off uh, for animals and art and architecture and cooking. Uh, and then get every table you can beg or borrow set up and label those tables clearly. Again, with those primary categories, you'll have a table for animals and a table for architecture, and a table for art. And, um, and lastly, post copies of the map on your end cap. So all the team members as they're working can just have to glance at the end cap and they see what's what. So we started by using uh, splitting up a couple of reshelving teams. Uh, one started at the OOOs or what became animals, the beginning. And uh, the other at the very end, 999s or true crime. 
and they worked toward each other. And that saved a lot of bumping into one another. Uh, the shelves are only three, three and a half feet apart. So you don't have a lot of room for a bunch of people to be moving past each other. Uh, and we uh, also had teams, I didn't write it here, but we had teams work on the tables. So teams that were pulling uh, books off the shelves would just plunk them down on the correct uh, primary category table. They didn't try to put them in order. They just plunked them down and went back for another arm load. And uh, then I had another crew at each table, and their job was to put them in perfect shelf order. Um, and so they were ready to put back on the shelves, and it worked out swimmingly. So once everything was sorted and it went very quickly, then we had two teams again start putting them back on the shelves in BISAC order. And then the teams that had been working the tables had the sheets of uh, little white labels and they would follow along and start covering up those Dewey numbers. And we got it done in the day. So, and that was uh, upwards of 9,000 books. And so it worked well, it worked well. Um, <clears throat> now, unfortunately, we couldn't remove the initial Dewey number from the beginning of every record in our ILS as a batch process. More is the pity. Uh, so we had to do it the old fashioned way manually. But even then, all hands were on deck and we were so excited to get this thing done that we kind of neglected some of our other duties to make this happen and we got it done in a week. So um, hopefully you will have a batch process available to you. If not, just uh, put your shoulder to the wheel and get it done. And uh, then you can call it complete. Here, by the way, is a copy of the map I used. I created it using Excel, but you can use graph paper. It doesn't matter as long as everybody knows exactly what's going where. Uh, so do make that map. And now everything's done and dusted. And here's a photograph of some of our new books. And you can see uh, it's uh, going swimmingly. Um, and the staff are very happy with the new system patrons for the most part are very happy with the new system i still have a couple who like to tap me on the shoulder and tell me they don't see why i had to do get rid of dewey they like dewey um uh, but they're all all in it with us and they're all good eggs so uh it it went well and our nonfiction circulation is increasing and it had been going the other way i'd love to be able to tell you that it doubled it didn't but it is trending upward. And on a good month, uh, we would have, say, a 10 to 15% increase over the same month the year before. It's not always that grand, but it is trending upward. And my goodness, that's uh, what we call a net, net gain. That's a win. And we do have uh, lots of brochures available still and posters on the end caps that um, show people what the new system looks like. And I'll show you uh, the front page of our brochure right here. Um, and I lifted this design straight from the one that the Kent District Library did up in Grand Rapids. Thank you, Kent District, um, because I love the uh, cleanliness of the design. I like those big, bold bars that show you the primary categories. <clears throat> and you'll notice that I've got a couple of categories here with no subheadings uh, listed. And that was to save space. Uh, sports and science, those subcategories are so intuitive. Uh, patrons don't need any help figuring them out. I mean, sports, you're going to see uh baseball then you're going to see basketball then you're going to see hockey it's uh, real intuitive when you get to the shelf same thing with science you're going to see astronomy you're going to see biology you're going to see mathematics easy um so uh that was a bit of juggling to figure out what you're going to put on the brochure and what you're not but uh, in the main it worked out well for us and we still have those and will in perpetuity i'm sure just for new folks who are new to us and haven't encountered this before and that's it. Um, again, here are the links. Uh, and when this goes um, live online uh, at, at the YouTube channel, uh, you can click those. If you want them ahead of time, do jot down my email and send me uh, an email and I'll get them to you right away. No problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope that you find this helpful. I hope you, uh, if you start a project that you uh, find it uh, is a net gain for you as well. We certainly did. I'd have no regrets about doing it. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your attention. I'll happily take any questions you might have. All right, great. All right, great. Um, <clears throat> all right yes, uh, <clears throat> this will. This is being recorded. It will be available just for anyone to let you know. Um, 
probably later this afternoon, um, along with the slides. Um, we do have one question that and I'm not sure if you mentioned. I don't recall if you talked about this at the beginning. Um, yeah. Is um, the question that someone did ask already, does BISAC only apply to nonfiction or does fiction figure into it too? Is there fiction options in BISAC and you just decided to only do your adult nonfiction or? Well, let, let me show you. I'll go over to BISAC right now for you. I haven't looked at their fiction, but I'm going to I'm going to answer that for you right now. Because they do have a fiction section and they also have I'll scroll down here. They have young adult fiction, young adult mm -hmm. nonfiction. Uh, but let's click fiction and see what it looks like. Uh, yeah, there you go. You certainly can. Mm -hmm. You must certainly can. But you've only all you the only part of we your life that. was the adult nonfiction. Exactly. So, yeah, OK. Yep, we have uh, we have the usual uh, mysteries, science fiction, and westerns, but uh, but we didn't uh, we didn't use this for fiction. Although who knows, we may decide to try it. Mm -hmm. But there you go. So was that was that your fiction people were okay with finding things in there that use it differently than nonfiction? Obvious. Well, yes, obviously. Yes. Yes. Uh, our fiction section, no one seemed to have any trouble. Wow. Uh, Finding and um, with our fiction, also we made it a point several years ago to label them. If they were in a series, we put the name of the series and the number that the book is within the series on the spine label. Oh, nice. Yes, and we shelve them uh, in, in series order. Um, of course, it's within the the author's last name, but within that author, if they have a series, we shelve their books in series order, and people have absolutely loved that. Mm. So our spine labels are rather taken up, uh, many of them, with the series yeah, information. Yeah. So I'm not sure we'd want to really get into uh, the BISAC. But it looks like it's there for you. They've, they've built something for you to uh, use as a framework. People can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we do have another question. Um, did you consider using the BISAC heading followed by the first word of the title versus author name? We did not consider that. We did not consider that. Nope. Is that something that I have people seen other places do it that way or? Yeah, I have not seen it myself. To other libraries that were using it. Were they doing it the way that you did? Yes. Mm, okay. Yep, yeah, they were because uh, again, the, the spine label is such a, a limited space. Sure. Um, so if you're going to get a couple of subheadings under the primary, you really only have room for the mm -hmm. author's name. But that's not to say that you couldn't do it the way you describe using the title. That might be the path for you. Uh, it might make the most sense for your collection. So, right, you're going to have to see um, what you think your the people in your community are are doing, how they are looking at things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. The the best thing to do is um, take a collection uh, and and do a test run on it. And uh, you don't have to change the books themselves. I mean, you could make uh, just some a paper with the spine labels on it, like I showed you earlier, uh, and and put it up on the shelf, and then and walk down and look at it. How does it look? Mm -hmm. Is it easy to read? Right. We did a yeah. lot of that kind of a lot of that kind of testing as we went. Mm -hmm. And if you have any uh, willing um, patrons, ask them. Can you, you know? Uh, oh yes. You. you Test this out for us. Come in and do a test dry run and see, can you figure out what we're trying to do here uh, yep. with or without previous instruction? Like if you had no idea and walked down this aisle, tell us what you think. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Someone who doesn't have any preconceived notions about how it's supposed to work. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay. We have another question. I want to know um, for shelving, do you have, do you do any of the shelving like bookstores do with books lying horizontally or things like that for displaying them or? Well, do we don't have much room in our nonfiction collection for a lot of face out displays. However, in our fiction uh, and large print and biography sections, we do have room and at the end of every shelf is a face out display. Ah. Every shelf has one and we keep them filled and it's working. Mm -hmm. And as we go through our nonfiction, I was talking about, as a matter of fact, with some of the, the team and we may well uh, rejigger nonfiction a little bit so that we can put a face out on every shelf. Mm -hmm. It works. It really yeah. does. Yeah. Face out shelving pays off. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, that's and when I'm browsing, I, that always catches my eye first, unless I'm looking for something in particular, like a series, and mm -hmm. where are all those books in a row that I need to get to the next one. <laughs> mhm. Mm mhm. Mm exactly. Yeah. 
All right, so anybody have any other questions? That's the last one that was entered so far. Um, go ahead and type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. If you do have a microphone, we can unmute you and you can ask your question that way. You just gotta let me know. So um, we do have a few more minutes left on our hour today, so please do type in anything you do have. Um, as I said, the show has been recorded and I will have to process it through YouTube and then into their, um, well, I will go to webinar and into our YouTube account. Um, that may take some time. So sometime later this afternoon, all of you who did attend this morning and anyone who did pre-register and was unable to make it with us today will uh, get an email from me with that information where the recording is. Uh, Teresa, you can send me your slides whenever you get a chance after we're done here and I can post them as well. Very good, will do. And then as you said, the, all the links are there that you'll be able to link to as well um, when we get the archive up. Um, all right, here we go. We have another question that just came in. Um, do your pages find holds as quickly as when you were using Dewey? Has it affected yeah. that in any way? No, uh, everything was very easy to find once they got used to the new system. And of course, they had plenty of time to get used to it because it took us a while to get through the entire collection. So uh, as we went, they were they were used to, uh, the, and I, as I said, it took a couple of them uh, a little bit of uh, time to really grasp. But sure. uh, once, it, once they got used to it, then it's been going swimmingly. No, there's no hold up at all for yeah. finding things on the shelf. Um, it. It's nice that you had like a, a longish transition period when you were doing both so they can, you know, not yeah, as much it, of a shock, <laughs> a sudden shock. It, yes. It took us a couple of years and it, it probably won't take uh, you guys that long. We had to stop in the middle uh, because we had uh, some other projects. We had to put this on hold to complete. Um, mm -hmm. So we had a bit of a hiatus in there. Mm. And if someone had handed us the edited list that we came up with of subject headings, we could have got it done in three months, I'm sure. But <laughs> a lot of our time was just talking about it and figuring it out step by step. Oh, sure. Yeah, the development. Yeah. So since you finished, it's been about a year. Yes, it has. But it took a, um, longer than that from when you first started the project because of... Yes. Um, yeah, it was about 2015 to 2017, mid-2017 that we completed it. And that was with having to take a break, not, not that it took yes. that entire time beginning to end. I don't no, want anybody to not, panic. Not at, all. <laughs> not at all. No, I think we could have got it done in under a year if we'd gone straight through. It was the only thing you had to do, yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. not how it works, no. Yeah. If only we could close the library for a month, yeah, we could have gotten it done. <laughs> all right. Uh, we do a just says, thank you. This has been very helpful. Yes. Oh, you're welcome. Good comment. All right. Um, all right, anybody have any last minute questions you want to ask, type them in now or reach out to Teresa. Her email address is right there. As she said, she is willing to um, answer any questions you have. And she had libraries that gave her advice and she'll give uh, back to you guys anything. Let me give just a few another seconds for anyone to type in something. I don't see if you're in the midst of typing, so I have to wait till you send it. I guess not. All right. I think we'll wrap it up for today then. Um, thank you very much. Every, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you very much, Teresa, for being with us this morning. This was great. Um, I know this is something I've read about and heard of lots of libraries doing this process. And it's good to have, I, I think you did, this is a great, you know, step by step. Here's how you can do it if you're thinking about it and have no idea where to start. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Um, and I'm really glad we're able to get you on the show here. Um, and actually, and if anyone's interested, Teresa, we'll actually be back at the end of August for another session, too, on yes, um, uh, another topic. And I'll show you that on our schedule um, in just a second here. So uh, I am going to pull back the presenter control to my screen here and show you. Do, 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 do. Come on. There we are. All right, so so this is today's show. Um, our Encompass Live website, you can go to, um, if you go to our Nebraska Library Commission webpage, you can find it there. The, the direct URL was in our, uh, we can do a search on our site. Um, you, so you can use your search engine of choice. Um, and that will also bring up Encompass Live. So far is the only thing called that on the internet. Uh, so if you just Google Encompass Live, you'll find us. Our main page is here where we have our upcoming shows. 
presentation or upcoming ones. Um, we find and we fix connecting a community at the library. That's Teresa back again to do a second show at the end of August. So if you want to join her again, sign up for that one. Um, the archive of today's show, I'll show you that first, will be right here at the end, at the um, underneath all of our upcoming sessions. We have our archives listed and they are in the most recent ones at the top of the list. So today's show will be up here at the top sometime before the end of today. It will be available and you will have a link to the recording and the presentation will be there for you. Our archives are also searchable, as you can see. We have a search uh, feature here where you can search all the entire history of the show or just most recent 12 months. That is because Encompass Live, this is the 10th year of our webinar series, our weekly webinar series of Encompass Live. So, And we do have all of our archives on this page. If I scroll all the way to the bottom, and I'm going to go quick scroll right now. So watch it. Watch your eyes there. It goes all the way back to January 2009 when we first started the show. So there is some older information here, um, old information, outdated information, and possibly links and things, services and products don't exist anymore. But we are librarians and that's what we do. We archive things so that we are, that everything is all up there. Everything is dated though, so you can tell exactly when the show was broadcast live and you'll know that that is information as it was happening at that time in 2009, 10, 11, 12, whenever. I'm going to scroll all the way back to the top now. But uh, So you can search our archives if you want to, and you'll see today's one at the very top there when it is ready. And as I said, everyone who is here today and registered will get an email from me when that is available and ready for you to look at. So I hope you join us for next week's show, which is a book talk show. Um, here in Nebraska, we have um, four regional library systems, and one of the names is missing from there, I've got to add. Um, and we are going to have the directors of those systems here next week, just talking for a meeting and talking about books that they like. So we'll have some book sharing next week of what our um, library system these are our they do consulting and training for libraries across the state so please do sign up and join us for next week's show and any of other shows we have here on the list i've got my september ones i'm getting confirmed you'll see more dates being added as um, i get those nailed down also, Encompass Live is on Facebook. You can see I have a link here. I've got our page open over here. So if you are a big Facebook user, give us a like over here. We do post when our shows are available. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. Uh, when our, our um, archives are available, here's last week's re a reminder saying the recording is available. So if you are do you use Facebook a lot, like us over there, and you'll get notified of what we have coming up. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning's show. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you again, Teresa, for being with us this morning. You're welcome. And we will see you hopefully on next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>